Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary by uh, Thursday, February 11th, 2021, or um, Abraham Lincoln's birthday Eve. Mm. People forget that now with President's Day. But, um, April 12th is Lincoln's birthday. And I think we should celebrate that given what's been going on in Washington. Uh, today's topic First topic is S7, which is an act relating to expanding access to expungement and sealing of criminal history records. Our witness is Sarah George, uh, the state's attorney of our largest county, Chittenden County. Um, so Sarah, uh, welcome to Senate Judiciary. I think this is your first time this year. It is my first time. Thank you well, for happy having New me. Uh, happy New Year. I guess it's a little belated. But That's all right. I'll take it. I'll nice take to it. have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I know that um, this bill was initially discussed on January 14th and I had sent an email, I think to all of you right beforehand. Um, I wasn't aware that it was being heard and just wanted to get one quick thought out or um, comment out to the committee. Um, I can readdress that, um, but since I was asked to testify and looked into it a little bit more, I would add just a couple of other um, sure. things. So with, the, with regards to the email that I sent, it was really just an, an addition of one word <laughs> or, or two words um, on, I think it was line, page 16, line 17, um, that essentially, at least my reading of it, prevented state's attorneys from stipulating to expunge felony property crimes um, really ever if if you read it in a particular way, the petitioners could seal by stipulation, but could not expunge by stipulation. Um, so the, the recommendation was just to add, um, the court may grant the petition to seal or expunge without a hearing. Um, and then I also wanted to, I had looked over prior testimony and um, was given a copy of o Attorney O'Reilly's testimony regarding the bill. And I would just echo her thoughts on the technical amendment to effectuate the, um, the surcharge amendment that was done. Um, there is some pushback within the judiciary around what that really means and whether or not it's really in their discretion to waive the surcharges when doing um, when doing expungements, they are still occasionally being denied due to um, that, that surcharge. So I, I do appreciate her language that she suggested um, in her testimony, but I believe was just proposed amendment. Um, the surcharges imposed by this section shall not be waived by the court except as part of an expungement or sealing proceeding where the petitioner demonstrates an inability to pay. I do think that would be incredibly helpful for a lot of the expungements that we're doing in Chittenden County. Yeah. And that, that was the, um, what a great deal of the testimony back before COVID hit uh, in Winooski um, when we had the public hearing. Yeah. I believe you were there. I was. And a lot of the witnesses had uh, significant surcharges that were making it um, impossible for them to make the payment. Yeah, and I mean, our surcharges in general are, are, are significant um, for people. And some of them are surcharges that, you know, they got 15 to 20 years ago um, and still just can't pay them off, um, which does seem like a, an unnecessary barrier for, again, the, the people that can't afford it, um, where people that can have had no issues with that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the final thing I just wanted to, I think, um, I don't know if James Pepper's on this call, but I, I'm sure that he has also said this. I'm sure the judiciary has said this, but I wholly support the expansion of expungements. Um, I would go beyond this even um, to allow state's attorneys to expunge anything um, that they deem appropriate really if certain criteria are met. Um, but with that comes a lot of additional work on our office. Um, in 2019, our office processed 3,517 expungement petitions. And in 2020, we did 3,497, wow. um, which is 
a lot of work <laughs> and it really has been put on um, myself and Chief, um, Chief Deputy State's Attorney Justin Dyron do all the review, which takes a lot of time because of frankly how complicated our expungement statute has become. Um, but then once we stipulate and file them, um, which we are now doing a lot more of because of Odyssey, uh, it's really difficult for people in the community to file um, things like this. So I'm actually doing the filing on behalf of a lot of people as well. And then when our office is processing them, Jennifer Buffard, our chief administrative assistant does all of them. And it is a lot, it's a lot of work um, for her, which again, we're all very grateful to do it. I just wanted to, I would be remiss if I didn't point out how much extra work it is on the offices yeah, and how much I think automatic expungements would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, I personally resisted automatic expungement for a number of reasons. And part of that is that I feel like a person needs to show the motivation to at least take some action to the last expungement. Um, maybe the, would, that's old fashioned. But. Well, and also, I mean, again, kind of going back to the, it, it sometimes takes me 20 minutes just to read the statute and understand whether or not a case is eligible. And I'm an attorney. Um, I think that to some extent, some people might read this statute and their motivation level will go down just because of the complications and not knowing whether or not their case is um, eligible. And then on top of that, when they call my office and say, I, I have this, I filled out this form, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't have an Odyssey account. Is that the only way I can file something with the court? You know, there's there's a lot of barriers for people that even once they do get that initial motivation to look into it, they stop um, because of the system, the system that we have. <coughs> yeah, so no. I didn't, I didn't have anything else specifically. Right. Yeah, Senator Nick. Senator Nick has a question. So I'm just wondering with regard to the Odyssey account and. <laughs> lay person to file that uh, is the fee there for them or uh, can the fee be waived or is this the there's no fee anymore there the the filing fee did get um, that got eliminated a, a couple of years ago so they don't have to pay a filing fee unless they're sealing a DUI I believe that still has a $90 filing fee but so no, but I, even, I think she's talking about the fee to Odyssey to have the oh, case yeah the fee to Odyssey because we're oh, putting, I don't know. We're putting I don't know. to Vermont Legal Aid to take care of the filing fees right now, anyway. Well, yeah. We get the um, figure out. Once the budget adjustment bill passes, that's where the money is to continue that through March. Yeah. Hmm. So I, 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 I would bring that up too, though, that there have been people who have wanted to seal a DUI and they do have a $90 filing fee. And getting that to the court while e-filing something is a whole nut. Like they're right now, they're mailing it to me, and right. I'm walking it down to the court so that I know that it goes in at the same time that I'm filing it for them. Um, it's there's a lot of complications. And again, I'm I'm happy to do it. It's something I care a lot about. But for a lay person, that motivation level gets less and less as each of those barriers is put up. Thanks. So, I guess my question to different folks that are in the meeting room in the meeting room right now is how can we simplify the process? So, without you know, I mean, I suppose you could say that every misdemeanor, other than domestic violence or something where the predicate offense could be. Um, done in a different way from some of the problems. Yeah, I know. I know that there is discussion around simplifying it, and I don't have. I'm not. I don't have the best answer because I. I know that some people think we should go to an all ceiling, and I really don't agree with that because I. I think that even the ceiling of records gets overused by law enforcement in ways that harm people, um, and so I, I don't necessarily agree with that particular outcome. Um, I do think that all, in, in most cases, all records should eventually be destroyed. 
Um, but I do think that the, the multi-level and different timelines can, can get confusing. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have the, I think there is a committee working on that though. I'm sure they can come up with something perfect. It's, um, we've got uh, Judge Brierson here. And I, I wonder if you'd like to comment today or wait until um, next week. I, I can uh, briefly comment. <clears throat> uh, good morning to the committee. Uh, good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Um, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, it's interesting to, to hear uh, Sarah talk about the, the workload on, on expungements because uh, I, I can't agree more. And, and as the committee knows, um, and I believe uh, more recently, Pat has uh, Pat Gable has testified in appropriations. I don't know if it was House or Senate appropriations. Had to be House. Yeah, on, on the, um, the cost involved uh, to process these. So I won't uh, belabor that point. I've, I've made that point to the committee before, but... Um, what Sarah is really saying, we use this word automatic, and whether it's her, her, even with the stipulation that she's talking about, even if the state and the, the party agree, there's still a, a work effort in, involved. And um, there is a, a committee, uh, if you will, an informal committee, myself, uh, David Scheer, uh, Matt Valerio, Marshall Paul, uh, May Reed, O'Reilly and there may be some others have been meeting informally while this bill is pending to talk about, you know, trying to to simplify the process. I, I think that's the, probably the best way to put it. Whether we'll be able to or not, I don't know. But I think Odyssey opens up some doors that were clearly not available uh, to us before. And um, at some point in, in this uh, discussion um, in, with this group, um, I will make sure that we get somebody from Odyssey involved who is intimately involved with what the program can do and not do. Um, and, and so far we have not done that, but I, I, uh, I, I understand um, uh, Sarah's concerns about sealing. I think what this committee has been discussing and you probably hear more from others involved, it's really a discussion of who has access, for what purpose, and for how long? Um, because in the final analysis, whether you call it our expungement or whether you call it sealing and eliminate any access, it's going to amount to the same thing under the Odyssey system. The court system will be an electronic system. There will be no paper files per se to be destroyed. Uh, it's a matter of an entry in a system that will say this file is, is confidential. There is no access. So we've got to figure out between the time of conviction, because that's the triggering event, until whatever the sentence is, um, it has been executed or, or, or completed, whatever term we want to use, it's that second point that is the triggering point for uh, the time to start on to what extent is a file sealed or do we wait, just by way of example, conviction today, do we wait three years before sealing, and then you have a period of sealing where you have to determine who has access during that sealing period before it reaches a final point um, that the system can trigger. The system can say three years after a conviction on a misdemeanor, it can be sealed. And these are the people that have access during the sealing period. And at some point in the future, let's say two years after sealing, all access is denied. The system can do that. The problem is, is picking up the intervening charges that may come in that may impact that. That's where you get into uh, <clears throat> DUI that um, normally maybe could be uh, expunged, but because of an intervening charge or an, another conviction, it won't. So we've got to work out the details of that, but the system will be different in the sense that it won't be destroying records. It will be denying access uh, to those records. And, and I, I, I would like to think there's a way of simplifying this and make it more, I don't want to te suggest to anyone that it's going to be completely automatic, but we can go a lot further um, 
than we have in the past. And, and we're, we would like, this committee would continue to work. And I think there's a provision in this bill as it reads now, uh, Senator, that talks about referring to the sentencing commission uh, mm -hmm. to decide if other offenses that could be expunged. And I would suggest, and I think I did in my earlier testimony, that as part of that re referral to sentencing commission, that they explore this um, uh, process of sealing and expungement so that it that it, it, it can be simplified. And I agree with, 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 with Sarah. I can remember when a request for expungement would come in before the stipulation, or even when a petition came in, and going through the statutes to figure out whether someone is eligible at that point in time um, is a time-consuming process. Um, the only other two points I'll make now, and I'll be glad to talk later. Um, I do agree with Sarah on the surcharges. That was, as you indicated, Senator Sears, part of the bill last year, and I think it got uh, lost. So we're comfortable with the language uh, that may read as proposed. The only other issue that I wanted the committee to be aware of, and as long as Sarah's here, I think she'll be familiar with it. It's come up a couple of times in the last six months. I've heard from VCIC um, the state and the defense are uh, stipulating to a sealing of a case, but the individual has a, a, a sex offender registry requirement that is not addressed. And so VCIC is caught in the middle. They get a, a, an order that says seal this, but it, has it says nothing about the impact on the sex offender registry. No. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's something that can be used to... Um, to, but, to discuss. I mean, that involves federal law as well, because there's certain consequences to not placing people on the registry who <laughs> have committed certain acts. And we, we are, um, as I remind myself, we forget it, but because we don't put minors on the sex offender registry, we are docked, I believe, 10% of the burn grant every year. Yeah, and I, I don't know the details of cases. So I don't know what, what the impact would be. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds... we've, had a couple, we've had a couple that came out of Chittenden County. That's why I referenced Sarah, and I think she's familiar mm -hmm. with them. But what they're finding is that person, for instance, might have a 10-year registry requirement, but uh, there's been an agreement to seal the record within that 10 years. And VCIC said, what are we supposed to do? So I, I just wanted the committee to be aware of that issue. And um, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. The more, rec more, more expungement that we get into, there's some of these collateral consequences that, uh, we, that need to be addressed. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> no, actually, next week, we're going to hear from the Justice Center. They've been doing some great work looking at um, barriers to employment um, and structure, structural barriers. And uh, Josh Grimes uh, will, will be with us next week. And Peggy um, will, I hope, will post by Monday. Um, he has three uh, PowerPoints. One is a playbook of national um, uh, barriers to employment. Um, uh, one is a playbook for Vermont specific to, they looked at Vermont specifically and what we do to prevent people from getting jobs. Much of this is gonna be in the government operations realm. And so we're lucky to have Senator White on this committee, but um, it's amazing the work they've done. And they're actually some kind of a grant and I'm not sure what it is, but are willing, would like to work with Vermont on these uh, collateral consequences, um, occupational licensing, business licensing, and employment, health care, banking, transfer, insurance, adult care, at nursing homes, the, the whole bunch of things. So there's three PowerPoints that Peggy will post on our uh, website. I believe he's going to be with us next Thursday. Is that right, Bryn or Peggy? Um, he is or is it Wednesday? It is, hold on one second, um, Wednesday. So um, if you could post that so people can, who are interested can look at that um, before he testifies. Um, Do you want me to 
posted before Wednesday, typically. I'm yeah, why don't we post it on, on Monday to not confuse people about okay. what's going on this week. Okay. Um, but Brennan and I met with he and the director of the Justice Center, and uh, they're excited to work with Vermont on this. So I'm, it may hold up passage of the bill, but I think it would be good to be able to include some of these um, hindrances and it goes beyond expungement, but <clears throat> many of our um, barriers are unrelated to whatever job the person's looking at. Looking. Senator, I can just add to the comments Sarah made about uh, the self-represented litigant who uh, no. doesn't have access to Odyssey. I, I checked while, um, while we were talking and much like a person comes to the court now with their petition for expungement or used to, they can bring uh, their hard copy, their paper to the court and the court staff will scan that into the system. So it will become without charge. So the, essentially for the self-represented litigant without access to Odyssey, it's the same process. They come to court with their paperwork and it's scanned in by the staff. I don't know. I don't know that they can do that right now, but they could mail it, I assume. Right. Well, they, as long as they get the paperwork to court, yeah. uh, it'll be okay. scanned in and the right. process would be the same. Uh, I, I agree with everything that we can do to simplify the process for the person. Um, it's, it's, it can be intimidating trying to understand, and I, I've worked with a fellow who's getting a, a records expunged and he was thrilled to get three of his four crimes expunged, but then he finds out that one of them can't be expunged under the current law. And this bill would change that to allow him to expunge everything. He had no problem getting rid of three of them, but then the fourth one is a hindrance and that continues a barrier for him uh, to be able to do certain things. So I, I you know, I think that um, we should do whatever we can to simplify it. Both the, the judiciary, the state. I'm interested in one thing you said, Sarah, that um, I'd like to expand on further is the effect of sealing versus expungement and how you, um, that I, um, we've been talking about both sort of as um, IG, if it's simpler to seal, then let's just do sealing. Um, can you comment further on that? Why you're opposed to sealing? I'm not opposed to it. I, I think that I would echo what Judge Gerson was saying, that I think it more so depends on who has access to that while it's sealed, because right now, my understanding at least is that all law enforcement have access to that, even the, you know, the individual who's out doing traffic stops and can access somebody's sealed record from 15 years ago and use that as a pretextual stop, um, whether that ultimately holds up is another question, but I think that there, even within law enforcement, it really needs to be limited um, by, by who can see it and for how long. Um, I think that really the only reasons we should be able to see particular prior conduct is if it's a subsequent offense um, and recent. Otherwise, I just, I think that they are going to continue, it won't hold people back necessarily in the community and housing or other issues, but it will continue to hold them back within the legal system in ways that I think only perpetuate all of the same problems that we already have. And certain prosecutors will use old, old offenses against people um, that they, in my opinion, shouldn't be able to. So I just think the people that do a lot of the harm from prior using prior convictions against you pe against people are still going to have access to it and can still continue to um, harm them and I think that especially when it comes to it actually does ultimately hurt them in housing because if we're using those to ask for for example a case we maybe would have done some other alternative process for, but we see that they have this prior case that's similar from 15 years ago, and so we don't, we require that they go through the regular system and get another conviction. 
it just perpetuates the cycle for those individuals. It really doesn't allow them to fully move on when the people that can use it against them have access to it. But if it's recent oh. and it's a subsequent offense, then I understand the importance of that. And I think those cases, we should be able to see that somebody got a DUI two years ago and you know is getting another one. Um, that, that makes sense to me, but somebody having a felony from 20 years ago, a felony property offense, for example, um, that has long since done what they needed to do on that case and just ran into some other issue 15 years later, I don't think we should be able to use that against them. And it will get used against them by some prosecutors. Yeah. Do, do you have that same experience with the um, juvenile records too? Which have been sealed. I mean, we never... I don't yeah. think we ever expunge juvenile records, do we? Um, I don't know. We, we certainly don't in Chittenden County. Um, we don't look at those when somebody is out of the system. I mean, we've certainly had conversations. If a particular prosecutor knew that they had a case with that child, yeah. they may they may mention it, but we don't use that information in the criminal cases. But we could, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Chittenden County, they, we could use it against them and law enforcement could use it against them if they can have access to it. Hmm. They can. If they have access to it, they, I mean, whether they're actually using it against them, like they, they have that in their head, they can, their biases could be triggered, they can they can use that information, whether they say they're using that information or not. They, I have had law enforcement say, I saw that this kid had this particular violent offense when he was 15, like this isn't his first time. Those types of conversations happen um, when we're trying to get a 19 year old, especially now into youthful offender, we've had law enforcement bring those up. Like, well, this isn't his first time. He shouldn't get a youthful offender status because he, did this sort of thing when he was 15. So that's what I mean by they, they do use it against them in wanting a particular outcome. Hmm. That's helpful. Uh, I thought this was a simple bill. We <laughs> passed it last year and there wouldn't be any problem. I guess maybe I'm making it more complex, but it, um, there are problems with the current system and I, um, Hopefully we, we take another look at the bill and do whatever we can to make it as simple as possible for somebody to get their records expunged and remove the barriers. If they're eligible for expungement, if the state agrees, the judge agrees, there's no reason why we should need to do it. Okay. Um, anybody else would like to comment on this right now? You know, Senator, the only other thing I would add, pepper. yeah, the, the only other thing I would add is <clears throat> under the current statutes as to both sealing and expungement, the, the, the phrase is that if a person, if the court is asked, the phrase is there is no record, and that applies to whether it's a, a sealed or an expunged record. Um, and so in that sense, they're similar, and again, I'll just repeat myself that with the case management system, um, it, it should be easier to, to manage that electronic file uh, and hopefully eliminate some of the steps that are now part of this process. But I, I would agree with, with uh, Ms. George that it's, it's a question of access. Who and how long and what do they have to do to get that access? If we can resolve that part, then I think whatever we call it, sealing or expungement is not critical it's it's the access and for how long thank you thank you uh james thank Pepper, you. you thank you sarah appreciate your being with us james pepper did you have a comment i had uh yes for the record james pepper from the department of state's attorneys and sheriffs and i just want to thank sarah george for all of her work on expungement um her office uh 
you know, I think had, I think she mentioned 3,500 expungements just last year, um, which is an incredible undertaking. Um, <laughs> With the help of Legal Aid, of course, who's, who's been just so uh, incredible getting um, all of our state's attorneys on board and comfortable with expungements and sealings and has held, I think, expungement yeah. clinics in every county of the state, um, helping people navigate this very complex process. Um, I have one substantive uh, comment on the bill, if, if that's appropriate for this time. Yeah, absolutely. We've got about 25 minutes to continue talking about the bill. Okay. So, and I've raised this with um, at least some of the stakeholders that are in this, uh, you know, kind of informal subcommittee on sealing. Um, and what this bill does is it, it allow, it expands eligibility to a number of crimes. In fact, all the crimes except for the non-listed crimes. And uh, it, it applies to all non-listed and non-drug trafficking crimes. So it also allows a the respondent, which could be either the state's attorney or the attorney general to stipulate to, uh, to waive a time period, um, the waiting period uh, for any crime. And that, that is a good thing. And it's something that the state's attorneys have asked for uh, in the past, the ability to waive certain time periods. Where we get a little bit nervous is that there's this concurrent jurisdiction between uh, the state's attorneys and the attorney general for waiving those time periods. And so the office that prosecuted the case is not necessarily the office that would be allowed to waive that time period. And that gives us a little bit of pause, um, especially considering the victim notification that's required under uh, 7608. Um, so, you know, it's our, it's the office that prosecuted the case that I think should be in charge of determining whether uh, to waive the time period or not and do that victim notification. You know, it's uh, the office that prosecuted the case that has the victim advocate that has the relationship with the victim um, that should be the one reaching out to that victim and seeing if there's any objection to the sealing or an expungement. And I would say that, um, I think without exception, when people are elig eligible for expungement and they don't have any disqualifying um, criteria and the victim has had an opportunity to weigh in, it's very, very rare. And I think um, it would be difficult to find many cases where a state's attorney has not granted an expungement or a, or a sealing. But I do think that it should be the office that prosecuted the case that is in charge of determining whether or not to waive that time period. Bryn, do you have that um, as a possible amendment? I have not talked to Bryn about that, but I, I'd be happy to. No, I do now, but. Um... Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I thought, <laughs> I, um, I understand. What about when they do the clinics, though? I mean, you have so the I, I state's wouldn't... attorney and the attorney general there. If that's the case, then if there's that open line of communication, um, that's fine with me. It's just that we've seen a couple of times where um, a, an expungement petition has come through where the state's attorney had not been notified, and it was because it was done. And and I don't know the specifics of of maybe you know there was an attempt to notify uh, that just didn't happen, but um, we've seen one or two instances around the state where you know a sealing order or an expungement order comes through and the state's attorney had no idea. Um, so. Can, um, David, did you want to comment on that since you're the one, you're the attorney, you're not the one, excuse me, you're the attorney, you're representing the attorney general's office. Sure, <clears throat> thank you, Senator. Uh, and for the record, David Chair with the attorney general's office. Um, on that point, it is the case that we have concurrent jurisdiction the way the statute's written to stipulate to expungements if we chose to. It's my belief, it's my understanding that in every case in which we've done that, there has been consultation with the state's attorney's office involved. I have, and I, you know, I understand there's <clears throat> different evidence being put in front of the committee, but that that is not my understanding of what's happened. 
it is the case that um, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have standing permission actually from the Chittenden County State's Attorney to review and stip stipulate to expungement conditions, sorry, expungement petitions out of Chittenden County. Uh, and when David Cahill was state's attorney in Windsor County, I had similar standing permission to do that. This was especially relevant during the clinics that you're talking about, where even though they take place in one county, uh, you know, people don't often realize that they're, uh, or, or whether they realize it or not, that we get, we get uh, petitions for cases that were coming out of all counties uh, at, at these clinics, even if they're uh, aimed at one specific county. So it was often very useful for me to be able to do that. Um, and in cases where we didn't have standing permission, there have been times certainly when um, the attorney general has felt that a expungement or stipulation was was warranted. And, but my belief was that in, in my and what I witnessed uh, being present at the clinics is that the attorney general would call the state's attorney and say, look, I really think this is a one that's worthy of stipulation and I'd like to sign it and and talk to them about it. So I, I don't know, you know, I don't I don't know the specifics of the cases that uh, Attorney Pepper's talking about. Um, I do think it's useful in um, volume management, especially for some of these big counties to be able to have these cooperative agreements. Uh, it's certainly I would certainly never stipulate to a petition unless I had some sort of permission from the state's attorney and I. Uh, my belief is that is the policy of our office. Um, and really nobody else in our office, frankly, deals with expungements other than me. Um, but yeah, so our, our, our position would be that it is useful and helps deal with volume management and can be a useful tool to have uh, the Attorney General's office able to review these as well. And I understand that's a perhaps a point of disagreement with, uh, with us and, and some of the state's attorneys. Um, but just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, uh, Pepper. I I just I I would actually agree with um, most of what uh, Attorney Share has just said, and that I do think it's useful for there to be this concurrent jurisdiction with respect to um, sealing and expungement. What I'm I'm just talking about this additional provision that would allow. Uh, the respondent, which is either the state's attorney or the or the attorney general under current law, to waive the time period. I, I think that that you know that could mean a person is um, convicted of a crime on today, and then tomorrow, um, the attorney general could come and seal the petition or stipulate to seal the petition when when that office did not was not involved in the prosecution. So I'm only concerned about this additional new authority that's being granted. That would allow um, either the state's attorney or the uh, attorney general to to waive that kind of waiting period, um, which is permitted under S seven. All right, we should highlight that um, when we get to markup. Um, there was a discussion about careless and negligent driving. Um, Where were we with that, Matt? Valerio, I think you were. <clears throat> Somebody brought it up. Is that expungible? No. Are, we, are we talking about negligent operation with serious bodily injury or death resulting? No. That, that's what I think we were talking about. It's, I believe those are listed. Um, currently, um, and if listed crimes were being excluded, then they wouldn't be um, ex expungible. But to me, those are usually negligent acts that uh, over a period of time, if uh, there are no further problems, should be subject to treatment like other negligent acts and, and, allow, uh, and allow expungement. Um, you know, there's not a criminal intent necessarily and what uh there's not a criminal intent necessarily but, but you know by definition it is a negligent act um that we have uh chosen to criminalize um so you know to me at at some point they need to needs to be something that comes off the record if uh 
you know, if there aren't any other problems. I mean, there's, what I think about, when I think about, you know, worthiness for expungement or for, um, or sealing is what type of, uh, are, are you intending to commit a crime? Are you intending to do something that is criminal, is there some sort of criminal thinking or, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to use the Latin, but the bottom line is a, a criminal element to your thinking that gives rise to what the state has deemed to be a crime. And to me, the, the negligent or unintentional type acts are the types of things that are not the product of criminal thinking. They are the product of mistake. They are the product of, of, of uh, inadvertence or negligence or um, not paying attention. Where if you can get that under uh, control and understand uh, that you need to pay attention, that you need to be, um, to be uh, attending to detail and the like, like when you're driving. Um, those are the kinds of things that down the road would warrant a, uh, an expungement and sealing. And I use those two words interchangeably. Uh, I, I know and it, it's, it, it just confuses things, but um, you know, I, I can see we're gonna under, ultimately distill this down to what is the equivalent of expungement, no matter, no matter what you call it. So, um, to me, I'm trying to get at the concept of what sorts of things are worthy of expungement on their face because of the lack of criminal thinking that went into uh, the crime to begin with. Thanks. That's actually helpful. <clears throat> Sometimes Senator, I wonder you know, how things get on certain lists. Um, you know, when we've created lists of the big 12 listed crimes, we add to those lists, and do things with them at some point. Um, is, it, is it the correct? Well, I mean, it's clear over the years that the various victims groups and advocacy groups have had, uh, you know, access the legislature to cr help expand the list of listed crimes from the old common law, Mrs. Baker crimes, or what you call the Big 12 now. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, th that was a that was a time during the early 90s and the like when, um criminalization of a lot of behavior started to uh, started to erupt, particularly regarding um, alcohol, uh, drugs, and domestic violence. And I, I will, and I, and I, we keep talking about this domestic, the domestic violence as being one of the things that we uh, are uh, keep excluding from things. I, and I I'm just mindful of a, a seminar that I actually went to or attended last Friday from a, with a professor from the University of Maryland who was an advocate during the 90s regarding the domestic violence um, issues and was, she says, one of the people who got domestic violence on the various lists as like listed crimes and, and the like. And then she's studied the issue over the last 30 years and has now come to the realization that we've done it completely wrong um, and, uh, and that we need to deal with domestic violence in a different way. I, I really wish that the legislature at some point would uh, give her some time to, whether it's in this committee or another one, or you know, depending on the time frame. Her, her name is um, Lee, uh, I'm sorry, I am um, uh, Lee Goodmark, and she's a uh, 
doctorate professor at uh, University of Maryland, University of Maryland Law School. Um, and uh, she talks about uh, the ways your, uh, certain European countries have addressed domestic violence in a way that has made progress on recidivism where in the United States, despite our efforts, we really haven't um, made the type of progress that you would, you would hope on the subject. In any event, separate, separate issue, but uh, you know, it's clear how these lists uh, expanded over, over time as um, interested victims groups um, became more active in the political process. I was just looking for the through my file of the last one, looking at how we the lat the bill last year and uh, interesting. My note from Sarah George <laughs> need to simplify the system. This is one twenty seven twenty. Senator White. I was just going to comment on on what Matt just talked about because I have, and I know this has nothing to do with the expungement thing, but it is a follow up on that. The I I know that we will not allow domestic violence cases to go to um, the criminal justice center or uh, community justice centers. Um, they're excluded from that, and I know that when the sheriff down here was um, doing his ankle bracelet program. The, um, they said you cannot do a DV cases. You just, they aren't eligible. They shouldn't ever happen. And he convinced um, the state's attorney and the, everybody to allow this person to do it. And it was the best thing that had happened both to that person and to the victim. So I think that we, we lump these things in and it doesn't make any sense. And I agree with Matt, we really should be, um, taking a deeper look at that. I think it's one of those things that we, we probably just need to look at just by virtue of the fact that we aren't really making a lot of progress on it uh, with what we're doing. So unless mm -hmm. there's no way to handle it ever, and we just throw up our hands and say it's something that has no remedy, um, mm -hmm. then we'll look at other things. And I, as I understand it from the from Dr. Goodmark that, uh, um, there are programs that have worked um, in uh, in Europe and in other places that uh, show, show good promise with recidivism and and the like on the domestic violence front, um, but it's not the way we address things here. Mm -hmm. Senator, if yeah. I might comment on the careless operation, yeah. careless and negligent operation. Please piece. do. Yeah. Uh, so the comments just now spurred me to do a quick search through both the bill and current law. Uh, by way of background, it is currently one of the perverse outcomes of our statutes that somebody can get a DUI sealed but cannot get a careless and exit operation sealed even though DUIs often get pled down to careless and negligent. So it's a bizarre outcome. Uh, but the reason why currently, the reason why they can't get them sealed is because they're predicate offenses and predicate offenses are uh, not eligible for expungement or sealing. It was the intention of this bill to include a bunch of predicate offenses and allow uh, predicate misdemeanors to be sealed and uh, or expunged. Um, but looking through the draft, I just noticed what I think might be an error, uh, but if somebody has an, uh, knowledge that this was a purposeful change, let me know, we can discuss it. But um, on page, Three of, uh, of S7, line, lines 15 and 16, it looks like there's an amendment to the listed offenses proposed that would, in fact, expand what is currently limited. The listed offense is currently limited to grossly negligent operation resulting in serious bodily injury or death, as defined in subsection B of the relevant statute. And it looks like there's an amendment that it would open it up so that the listed offense would become any negligent or grossly negligent operation. Um, so I just wanted to flag that because I, my sense is that it wasn't the intention to open that up, but maybe maybe there's some debate I'm, I'm misremembering. But I if it's like that change were to be made, then we would be left with a system 
where that couldn't be sealed or expunged. And I don't think that that was the intention, but again, I defer to- um, Are we, I'm, now I'm confused, so I need some help, Bryn. Um, are we saying simple gross negligent operation can't be expunged? No, so that, so that was not the intent. Um, the Sentencing Commission report uh, that was issued last year recommended um, an update to the listed crime statute that would correct the cross-reference. And there were, I had quite a few discussions um, with various individuals last year when I was working on the bill. So that removal of subsection B, and I, and I recently talked to um, Marshall from the Defender General's office about this. And in the next draft, that, um, that subsection B that's removed in the as introduced version was gonna be replaced. Um, okay. So the intent here was just to correct the cross-reference and not to expand um, what's considered a listed crime. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sears? Yes, Chris. Uh, Chris Fenno, for the record, uh, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I just wanted to state because of the conversation, not just what happened, but uh, the conversation about domestic violence and um, excluding it from from things, and you know, I've worked in the domestic violence field for over thirty years, and we have learned a lot. And I just want to assure, and I see now that Sarah Robinson is on this call, um, but I want to assure folks that the network, the network programs, and then nationally, people are working on these issues. They're hard issues, just like trying to reform the criminal justice system, how to keep victims safe and what that looks like and um, how we can make sure and ensure that yeah, our communities are safe for everyone is number one thing. And there are literally thousands of people working on this issue. Thank you. Um, yeah. In Brattleboro, it was the Domestic Violence uh, Network Program. And I believe the Bennington Network Program also supported the use of um, ankle bracelets for um, domestic abusers who were yep. um, getting treatment or whatever you want to programming. <laughs> necessarily programming. Um, it allowed them to continue their jobs, pay child support, other things. And then, I know that Pave, well, I, Pave was actively involved um, in Bennington. I don't know what your women's network program is called. Uh, the Women's uh, Freedom um, Center, but it also allowed the victim to know at any point where if the um, violator had um, strayed off and um, gone someplace where he or she wasn't supposed to go. It, 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 was a, it was a good program. I would agree. Sorry we lost it. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> um, it being uh, almost 10 o'clock, Sarah, did you want to make a quick comment? And then we'll come back to this next week. Sure. I would, I would just say, uh, you know, we're very supportive of these ongoing conversations. And Senator White, I know there's been and we've been in conversation with the attorney general's office about the current carve out that there is around not referring um, domestic and sexual violence oh, cases to community justice center. So I just wanted to assure the committee that those conversations are very robust and ongoing. And um, we certainly hope to come back, um, you know, in the coming years uh, with a with a very with some policy proposals. Um, but those are conversations are ongoing, lots of stakeholders involved in those, and we very much see the potentials for um, diversion and restorative justice to have more of a role in domestic and sexual violence cases than they do right now. Good, thank you. With that, we'll take a break until quarter after um, and, and then pick up with one of the yes. <laughs> All right, S18. lost my agenda. S18. S18, thank you, lost my agenda. Third, pick up with S18, um, which is a bill regarding earned time. Uh, we're going to sign off YouTube for 15 minutes and be back at 10.15. Thank you.